To find out more about the series, please go to virgilkaylock.uk. The Strange Tales of Virgil Kaylock. Wormwood. Chapter 2 I knew what I would see on the other side of the door. I should have been up early. I should have visited him as soon as I could. Aunt Beth had woken him an hour ago, but I had dawdled and breakfasted and pontificated, and now I stood outside the room, not wanting to enter. He lay on his back, his mouth open and his chin unshaved. But he was breathing, snoring gently. I did not want to wake him, and I considered leaving the room and closing the door, but instead... I walked to the chair by his bedside and waited. It was a crisp morning. The sun was climbing the sky and dust particles danced in the thin gleam that had made its way through the heavy curtains. After waiting for some time, I became aware that he was watching me. Father, fetch me some water. How are you feeling? Ooh. Would you like me to fetch Aunt Beth? No. Sit down. You look tired. I'm quite rested, thank you. And how do you feel? I'm dying. She fusses over me. The doctor is here, prodding and poking, stupid man. It's obvious, but they won't say what they see in front of them. They gave me a repulsive liquid to drink. I won't touch it, filthy stuff. If it helps. You'll be neglecting your work. It's all right. I have um, been given leave. But if you need to rest... I'm not one for lying around, nor should you be. You don't have a choice. You need to get well. I won't get well. How's your job at the museum? It's... Uh, it's... Uh, it's going very well, actually. Curator? Um, yes. Moving up the ranks? Yes. Absolutely. Well, it's a job. There we are. You'll find something better. It's still time. What about marriage? Um, no. Nothing yet. Nothing? No, not yet. Well, uh, perhaps. I've met someone. You have? Yes. Good. Get married. Get a career. Put your life in order. Before you know it, you'll be lying here trying to make sense of it all. Don't be an idiot. Don't waste it. No. What? I said, no, I won't waste it. Don't waste it. Who is she? She's very nice. Good family, all that. You'd like her. Family name? Uh, Belle. They approve of you? I've not met her family yet. It's, uh, it's not so important these days. Don't bring her here. No. Beth has her hands full. If it's too much, I could get Aunt Beth some help. No, don't interfere. I was talking to her about Mother. She couldn't tell me much. Well, that's all over and done with. I would like to know... I would like to know what my mother was like. I won't talk about the past. It's my past, too. Leave well alone. Remember your mother as a good woman. I don't remember my mother at all. How could I? I do not wish to speak of it. Of what? I know nothing about her, nothing at all. I've been told since I was a child that she was a, a wonderful woman, and that's all. But it's not enough. I don't know a single story about her. My mother is a complete stranger to me. She was wonderful and devoted and kind, and that's all. I know she was religious. Religion, like anything else, can go too far. You start believing in things you can't see. Where does it end? Faith was important to her. It killed her. She died in childbirth. <laughs> <clears throat> I was away too much overseas. Neglected her. Don't neglect them. The devil makes work for idle hands. It was your job. It was my duty. To the country. To the queen. To serve. To die if necessary. But she had her duty too. You're like her. Impressionable. How was she impressionable? That's enough. I'm tired. Call Beth. Father, I deserve to know. I need to know. Call Beth. Please, Father. She had a weakness of the mind. If you believe in angels, it's not long before you're believing in devils, too. 
You weren't safe with her. She never met me. I never knew her. Go to the dresser. Open the top drawer. It's your gun. No, not that. There's a wooden box. Yes, I have it. Open it. What do you see? Jewelry. Your mother's. There's a crucifix, a thimble and scissors. There's a timepiece and some baby socks. Yours. What else? Is there a locket? Yes, there is. Open it. It was a silver pendant locket and chain. It was not richly decorated, but the front of the case was inscribed in Latin. Aurium unam de sacris clavem. I opened the clasp. Behind the glass, a young woman, my mother, seated on a balloon back chair by the same jardiniere that was in the picture on the mantelpiece downstairs. She was looking earnestly at the camera, with my father in uniform standing formally at her side. And there, in her arms, she held a child. It's you. <laughs> that can't be. She died in childbirth. Take it. It's yours. I don't understand. She died after you were born. You were two years old. There. Now you know. No, I don't understand. Call I... Beth. But she... Call Beth. I've told you what you want to know. Now do as I say and call Beth. I was shaking. I slumped on the floor outside my father's door. A fog had entered my head. I couldn't think. I clutched the locket tight in my hand. I prized it open and looked hard at the photograph, studying every detail and returning again and again to the child in my mother's arms. I had repeated the story so many times that I had never questioned it. My mother had died at the moment of my birth. It was a defining fact of my life. She was the mother I had never known. But it was not true. She had nursed me. She had cradled me like all mothers do. How could I have forgotten? And why had I been deceived? Why had I been lied to? I want the truth. I have a right to know. And I told you. Why have you kept my own mother a secret from me? Because telling you the truth would have been worse. You were a child. You had no right. You have deceived me. I want to know what happened. I want to know the truth. Very well. Your mother died in a fire at St. Austin's mental asylum shortly after that picture was taken. She was insane. My God. Your mother was sick. She was incapable of looking after you. It was decided that she should be looked after elsewhere. Who? Who decided? You were not safe with her. I stood stock still in the semi-darkness, watching my father while he looked deep into the shadows. My mouth was dry. I felt faint, my chest rising and falling in shallow gasps. Excess in anything will destroy you. It doesn't matter what it is, drink or opium or God. I blame myself. My second posting had been three years. A soldier does what he's told, even a colonel. She hated the solitude, alone all day in the house, no friends, not enough for her to do. She wanted a child, prayed for a child. First it was Sundays, but then she was there every day, and all night, sitting in the pews on her own, singing, creating a disturbance. They asked her to leave. She wasn't right. She was seeing things. She was depressed. After you were born, things only got worse. Talking to spirits. She lost her mind. And you locked her up? Yes, I did. Aunt Beth was in the kitchen preparing food when I walked in. She studied my expression as I sat down at the table, the pendant in my hand. He told you? Yes. Well, it's time. You should not have been kept in the dark. It wasn't fair. Oh, thank God, no more secrets. Your father wanted to protect you. We all did, but it is only right that you should know the whole truth now. You can ask me anything. She died in a fire. She was placed in St. Austin's for her own safety. She was tormented by delusions. She needed protection. How long was she there? It was a temporary measure. We expected her to recover. We hoped it would pass. Your father wanted her home. But there was an accident. The hospital wing where she was being cared for burnt down. No one knows how it started. 
The hospital was evacuated, but your mother, Rachel, died in the fire. You were just a baby. There was a funeral? Yes, of course. At St. Barnabas, where she's buried. You were there, but you won't remember. I don't remember anything. You were encouraged to forget. We all were. Your mother loved you, Virgil. She prayed for a miracle, and she got one. You, her golden one. We hoped that once she had what she wanted, that she would find comfort, but things only got worse. I think being parted from you was the worst thing that could have happened to her. I held the warm silver case in my hand, a tiny sepia family, lost in time. Father said she talked to spirits. She did many strange things. What spirits? It was such a long time ago. Please try to remember. I don't know what it was. Her angel, her demon. Something she found in a book. A book? What book? An old book she took from the church. I don't know what it was. She was ill, Virgil. Don't try to make sense of it. You can't. A book. Please try to remember. A horrible old thing. A, a book of demons. Your father burnt it. It doesn't matter now. What was it called? I don't remember. It was something in Latin, I think. The spirit, did she give it a name? Yes, she did. It was a strange name. Mr. Greenhill. No. No. She called it... That's right, she called him Malfas. And he had a green suit and a cane. Malfas? Yes, that's it. I couldn't think straight. I had to be outside, to walk for a while. Thoughts crowded my head. I knew that I needed to move or emotion would engulf me. Skelton Woods were only a short distance away. They stood at the base of the hills that towered over Windermere, a thick line of trees which climbed the sides of the valley and then stopped abruptly, giving way to the rough grass and scree of the higher slopes. The bright morning had passed. The day had grown somber, cold and damp, and the sky heavy with thick grey cloud. The path had not been used for some time, and I had to beat back the brambles with a stick in order to proceed. But before long, the trees enfolded me, and I made my way into Skelton Wood. I did not care which way I took. I just needed time to think. There was no wind at all. Just the sound of crows calling high up in the trees. After half an hour or so, the wood thinned out, and I found myself in a clearing, roughly circular and spanning perhaps 50 yards across. The ground was bare earth, crisscrossed by animal tracks and devoid of foliage of any kind. Squarely in the centre was a mound of brown and black, bones and hide. It was the body of a fallen animal, a deer, it had clearly been there for some time. Decay had stripped the skin from the carcass and the discoloured ribs like long talons clawed at the sky. The head was mostly skull and horn, eyeless, grinning and already partly obscured by grass. I stood still. To proceed meant to pass by the rotten corpse and I held back. There was no noise at all. The sound of the birds which had followed my progress gave way to silence. A fluttering of wings and a single crow stood balancing on the bones. It looked around the clearing, jerking its head until, like tiny beads of polished jet, its eyes fixed upon me. It stood like that for a while, bobbing up and down and watching me closely. Then it hopped to the ground where it clawed and pecked at the bare earth. After a moment, it cocked its head to glance at me once more and then flew off to disappear into the trees. Stillness reigned once more. I walked a step or two into the clearing. Where the crow had stood a few inches from the carcass, a slender piece of metal protruded from the disturbed soil. The stink of corruption caught in my throat as I crouched down and prized the object from the mud. It was a spoon. A silver christening spoon, 
engraved in the traditional style, with flowers and fruits and curling vines. Rubbing off the soil with my handkerchief, I was able to read an inscription. Aurium unam, de sacris clavem. It was dated 1900. Three letters followed. V, C, K. V, C, K. Virgil Charles Kaylock. Dorothy, it's me. No. Oh. Hello, Virgil. I'm at High Skelton. Yes, I know. How is he, your father? How... how did you know? They said at the museum, you've been dismissed. Yes, I have. I was worried that I left you a bit, you know, suicidal. How is he? Not very well, actually. And how are you? Fine. Are you looking forward to your eclipse party? Look, Virgil, I'm sorry for what's happened. I am, honestly. But what do you want? Did you ever have an imaginary friend? As a child, I mean. What? No. Did you? He was a chap in a green suit. Right. Mr Greenhill. Uh, And why do I need to know about it? Because he's come back. What? What do you mean? I'd I'd like you to do me a favour. What? Listen... There's a book in the British Museum that I need you to find for me. They won't let me go through their book collection. They will. Ask Mr Chidlow. He likes you. What book? The library is on the top floor. It's called Pseudomonarchia Daemonum by John Weyer. 16th century. It sounds horrible. What is it? It's a grimoire. A what? A book of demons. Oh, for God's sake, I'm not going anywhere near it. I'm looking for something, someone called Malfas. No. Please, please, I need to know. His name is Malfas. Look, Virgil, I'm not going on a wild goose chase to the British Museum. I certainly don't want anything to do with demons or anything more to do with the occult. So no, I won't go rooting round in any dusty books. Sorry. My advice to you is to forget all about it and spend time with your father. Dorothy, I can't hear you. I never do. What's the point? It's happened. Dorothy. Dorothy, I can't hear you. Hello? Dorothy? Chapter 2 by John Ram. Virgil Kaylock was played by Nicholas Bolton. The young Kaylock, Daniel Fraser. Dorothy Bell, Ellie Turner. Aunt Beth, Jenny Funnel. Gordon Kaylock, Sam Dale. And the part of Mr. Greenhill was played by Gary Lilden. The music was composed and performed by Neil Brand. The Strange Tales of Virgil Kaylock is supported using public funding by the National Lottery through Arts Council England. It is produced by Richard Varman, Martin Malone, and John Ram. It is a Kalock production. To find out more about the series, please go to virgilkalock.uk.